Hello. My name is Atli Thor Christensen, and my presentation is called Memory, History, and My Life. One night in October of 1980, a 31-year-old restaurant manager named Steve Titus went out to dinner with his fiancée in Seattle, where they lived. On their way home, they were pulled over by the police. Titus's car resembled another one, driven by a man who had raped a female hitchhiker earlier that night. In a police lineup, the victim pointed at his picture, saying that it closest resembled the perpetrator. At the ensuing trial, the victim was much more confident and said that Steve Titus was definitely the man. Thanks to the work of an investigative journalist, however, the real rapist was found and later confessed to the crime. Titus filed a civil lawsuit but died of a stress-related heart attack before it was over at the age of 35. In a 2013 talk, Elizabeth F. Loftus, an American cognitive psychologist, used the Steve Titus case as an example of the real-world consequences which can lead from testimonies based on false memories. Loftus has done extensive research on the constructive nature of memory and how misinformation, for example in the form of leading questions, can result in faulty eyewitness accounts. As well as serving as an expert witness on countless court cases, including Titus's, her findings have changed notions of the reliability of eyewitness testimonies and, in a broader sense, human memory. Speaking about her experiences, she remarked, Just because somebody tells you something and they say it with confidence, just because they say it with lots of detail, just because they express emotion when they say it, it doesn't mean that it really happened. We can't reliably distinguish true memories from false memories. We need independent corroboration. Such a discovery might have saved Steve Titus, the man whose whole future was snatched away by a false memory. Considering Loftus's devastating case against memory, what can be said for it? What implications does this have for historical research that relies upon personal accounts? Can some value be extracted from historical sources of a subjective personal nature? Here at the University of Iceland, a few undergraduate students of history have been grappling with questions of the value of memory in a seminar titled, Can Memory Be Relied Upon? Eco Documents and History, roughly translated. According to the Center for the Study of Eco Documents and History, headed by Dutch historians Ariane Bagerman and Rudolf Decker, the term eco document refers to autobiographical writing, such as memoirs, diaries, letters, and travel accounts, and was coined in the 50s by historian Jacques Presser. Over the course of this semester, we have looked at the different kinds of eco-documents and discussed their nature and potential use for historians. Even though letters and diaries have served more prominently as historical sources over the last few decades, as Sigurd Gilvi Magnusson talks about in his 2004 work, Dreams of Things Past, in our seminar, an emphasis has been placed on autobiographies. Autobiographies have some distinct features that set them apart from other kinds of eco-documents. For example, when writing a letter or a diary entry, the author's subject is generally the present. When writing an autobiography or memoir, however, they are giving an account of their past experiences, their life. This can either be a certain chapter, as in a memoir, or the author's whole life up until the point of writing, as in a traditional autobiography. This act of writing about one's past naturally means that memory plays a key role in autobiographies, as the author reminisces and organizes his own memories into a written narrative. It's this fundamental connection with memory that makes autobiographies unique in this category of sources and at the same time is also what has traditionally made this type of source material suspect in the eyes of many scholars. In the last few decades, however, there has been a growing acceptance of using the individual as a lens for historical research, a shift which some have dubbed the biographical turn. The field of microhistory has been at the forefront of this general shift towards the individual and, in general, smaller units of research. It is perhaps one of the best examples of how sources of a personal nature can be used effectively in historical research. As in any field of study, there are different opinions about the methods and purpose of microhistory. In the 2013 book of dual authorship, What is Microhistory? Theory and Practice, two opposing definitions emerge. One, represented by Hungarian historian Istvan M. Sijarto, says that microhistory seeks to answer great historical questions with the study of small objects. The other, represented by Icelandic historian Sigurd Gilvi Magnusson, stresses the importance of the micro-approach. He likens the microhistorian's research method to that of a detective trying to solve a crime. In such a study, larger questions and general knowledge are of little use. Despite these somewhat antithetical definitions, they both share what Carlo Ginsberg called a reduced scale of observation. In a 1993 article in Critical Inquiry, Ginsberg, 
perhaps the best known proponent of microhistory, looked back on its beginnings in the 1970s. He sought to tell the story of these events in which he took part by relying on his own memory. He soon ran into trouble with this biographical approach and had to depend on other material in his research. Among other things, he revisited books he had been reading at the time to illuminate what had affected his thinking. Magnuson concludes in Dreams of Things Past that rather than being an indictment of autobiographies as reliable sources, Ginsberg's need to rely on additional sources accurately reflects the methods of both microhistorians and autobiographers. When recalling events and organizing them into a narrative, authors first rely on memory, but supplement it with other material where memory falls short. Thus, they slowly build a more complete picture of their life with their own recollections in conjunction with, and perhaps jogged by, letters, diaries, pictures, and official records. This in turn is not dissimilar to how microhistorians work. For instance, when studying an autobiography, they will include other sources from the period to paint a more complete picture and support their argument. Furthermore, the subjective nature of autobiographies is by some considered their greatest advantage. Historians who study autobiographies are rarely interested in solely extracting from them accurate descriptions of the past, of past events. Rather, studying autobiographies is one way of moving beyond the statistics and broad strokes of the more macro-focused history, which obfuscates the individual. Personal experience, as recalled by people themselves, provides an invaluable insight into the mindset of individuals, what they thought about the questions and concerns of their time, and how they lived their lives. Of course, a reader of an autobiography must keep in mind the writer's potential motives and deconstruct the work. Having done that, the potential gains from such a study are great. In conclusion, I'd like to talk about how all of this relates to us, students of history. The main assignment in our seminar has been to write a 15-page autobiographical essay, which I am still working on. The first five pages will be dedicated to theoretical discussion and methodology, and the latter ten to writing about a chapter of our own lives. I have chosen to write about my most difficult and life-altering experience, the illness and subsequent death of my mother in 2015. In terms of methodology, I will first rely on memory. Then I will look at other sources to aid in recalling events in more detail. For example, a diary I kept in my mother's final days, pictures from the period, and text messages between my mother and me. In doing so, I hope to gain a better understanding of autobiographies and how historical sources are made. Additionally, the idea is to perhaps come to terms with a traumatic life experience. I will use as a framework Professor Magnuson's ideas about transitions between life stages. These kinds of transitions have traditionally occurred at junctions determined by society's institutions, such as religious rites of passage, graduation from school, or entering marriage. Oftentimes, though, transitions can occur because of unforeseen circumstances which serve as catalysts for people's progression from one life stage to another. This assignment will be an interesting opportunity to decide for myself if memory really can be relied upon. Thank you for your time.